medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. Why could outside sunlight be beneficial for most viral illnesses and especially COVID-19? Coming up right now. Now we've known for some time that respiratory viral infections peak usually when the days are the shortest. And you can see that here with this graph depicting flu deaths per week in the United States. And clearly you can see that in the wintertime, that is when we have the peak deaths from influenza. Here's a graph depicting hospitalizations in San Bernardino County where I work. And you can see here on the longest day of the year, on the shortest day of the year, the longest day of the year, and the shortest day of the year, you can almost make out where there is an undulation underlying these peaks. The most recent peak here, of course, being Omicron. Of course, there could be many reasons for that. It could be the temperature, which is also different in the wintertime compared to the summertime, or even the humidity. These things are well known to impact how viruses spread. However, in this paper that was published in Nature, titled Autumn COVID-19 Surge Dates in Europe Correlated to Latitudes, Not to Temperature or Humidity, Pointing to Vitamin D as a Contributing Factor. And what they showed here very elegantly is that if you look at the inflation date or the date that that country experienced its surge, there was no correlation with temperature and there was no correlation at all with humidity. But rather, the higher in latitude the country was, the earlier the surge date. And the lower in latitude, that means closer to the equator the country was, the later the surge date. And essentially what this means is, is that when the days started to get shorter earlier in the more northern latitudes, that's when we started to see higher surges in COVID-19. There was also this data that we talked about very early on in the pandemic that showed that as vitamin D levels, as measured in the serum, started to drop below 50 nanograms per milliliter, there was an increase in actual SARS-CoV-2 positivity rates. And this relationship held up regardless of age or gender or race. Not only was vitamin D associated with an increased risk for SARS-CoV-2 positivity, but as you can see here from this graph, which was a study with 185 subjects, that patients with less than 12 nanograms per milliliter had a worse survival as inpatients when hospitalized for COVID-19 than patients who had vitamin D levels greater than 12 nanograms per milliliter. And that relationship held up even if the threshold was at 20 nanograms per milliliter. So what was clear at this point was we knew that vitamin D was a marker for better outcomes, or specifically, low vitamin D levels was a marker for poorer outcomes. But because of the studies that were conducted and the way they were conducted, we could not tell whether vitamin D was the cause of that or whether it was simply a marker of something else that was the real reason for the difference in SARS-CoV-2 positivity rates and survival as inpatient. And so a number of randomized placebo-controlled trials were undertaken to see whether or not vitamin D taken prospectively would change the outcomes in patients with COVID-19, both before they went into the hospital and after they went into the hospital. And while there were some studies that were positive in some respects, there were also studies like this one that had no impact on the outcomes of severe COVID-19 in hospitalized patients. If you'd like to see more information about vitamin D and COVID, please watch our COVID-19 and vitamin D update. But in order to understand why sunshine might be beneficial in COVID-19, you have to be able to understand the energy that's coming from the sun in the first place. This graph represents the energy coming from the sun. And as you can see here, 39% of the energy that comes from the sun, we can see in the form of visible light. In terms of vitamin D, which is produced by specifically ultraviolet B radiation, you can see that only a small portion of the energy from the sun is invested in ultraviolet radiation. What you may not realize is that 54% of the energy coming from the sun is invested in infrared radiation or infrared light that we cannot see that is coming from the sun and specifically near-infrared radiation, which is in this area right here, 
is involved in making melatonin. That's correct. Melatonin directly in the mitochondria of the cells within the reach of infrared radiation. Now, you should understand that because near-infrared radiation has a longer wavelength, it's able to penetrate much more deeply into the body than light in the ultraviolet spectrum. Here's a similar graph, except here we're looking at the spectral irradiance, or literally the power of the sunlight that's coming down in that spectrum. Again, as we talked about, ultraviolet radiation, there is a very little amount of energy that's coming from the sun in the ultraviolet spectrum. We can see here the amount of visible light in terms of the power from the sun, but all of this to the right of this black line here, till about right here, is in the near infrared spectrum. And you can see all of this red here is the energy that comes from the sun. How do we interact with this energy? Usually it is felt as warmth in the skin. So even on a warm, sunny day, if you're wearing clothes to protect you from the sun, you'll still feel that warmth deep into your skin. And that's because this near infrared radiation is not only penetrating through the clothes, but it's penetrating through the epidermis, which is the outer portion of your skin, and deep down into the dermis and actually past the dermis into the subcutaneous tissue. Actually, a number of cells in your body open to receive this near infrared radiation. So what happens when this near-infrared radiation penetrates deep down into your skin and your tissues and it goes into the mitochondria? Well, first we have to understand what the mitochondria is. So the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It makes ATP, which is the currency of energy for the cell. And just like an engine that is responsible for locomotion, the byproduct of that locomotion is heat. And that heat, if not dealt with, can actually shut down the engine and cause a lot of engine damage. It can seize up the engine. Well, this also happens in the mitochondria. Its job is to produce ATP, as we discussed. But in addition to that, it also, as a byproduct, produces something called reactive oxygen species, which contributes to oxidative stress. For those that want to look at that more, look at our MedCram Update 65. So these reactive oxygen species, things like superoxide or hydrogen peroxide or hydroxy radicals, are extremely reactive elements, molecules, that can destroy the machinery of the mitochondria and quickly cause damage that will lead to very bad conditions. And specifically, those bad conditions can lead to many things that we are familiar with here in the United States, such as inflammation, diabetes, obesity, thrombosis, basically less optimal health. The good news is, is that our body has a way of taking care of those hydroxy radicals and reactive oxygen species. Just like an engine has a cooling system to take care of the heat to make sure that it doesn't shut down the engine, the mitochondria also have its own cooling system. It's called an antioxidant system. And the main antioxidant system of the mitochondria is melatonin. It has a way of dealing with it in both night and day. During the night, when the human body is not active, the brain secretes melatonin through the pineal gland. Melatonin then goes throughout the vasculature, going into the cells, and the mitochondria actively take up this melatonin. The melatonin mops up these hydroxy radicals, protecting the machinery of the mitochondria at night. But during the day, there's a much different way of dealing with this, a much more direct way. During the day, sunlight, and specifically near-infrared radiation from the sun, can penetrate deep down into the body and specifically is activating something called cytochrome C oxidase, which is part of the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, which is where that machinery is. And this stimulates the production of a number of things, including melatonin, which is twice as effective as vitamin E is in terms of antioxidant, and actually itself upregulates glutathione peroxidase, which is one of the antioxidants involved in the antioxidant system. This along with catalase and a number of other antioxidant systems. So that melatonin, which is the king of antioxidant systems, is directly upregulated right in the spot where it's needed to take care of oxidative stress. So what does this have to do with COVID-19 in the first place? Well, remember that angiotensin II, which is a prooxidant, is converted into angiotensin 1-7, which is an antioxidant. 
and this happens in the cells. The prooxidant, angiotensin II, increases blood pressure, whereas angiotensin I-7 can reduce blood pressure and is actually relaxing the vasculature. Well, the enzyme that does this is ACE2. Yes, this is the same ACE2 that is the receptor for the spike protein. And so if you have angiotensin II, which is a prooxidant, that is going to increase the amount of reactive oxygen species in the cell, which is not good. Whereas angiotensin I-7 is going to decrease the amount of reactive oxygen species in the cell. So the problem is, is that when you get an infection with SARS-CoV-2, it knocks out the ACE2 enzyme because of the spike protein binding to it. And so as a result of that, you have an increase in angiotensin II and a decrease in angiotensin 1-7. Both of those lead to increases in the reactive oxygen species. Now, if that's not bad enough, an infection in SARS-CoV-2 is going to increase white blood cell production, which is also going to increase reactive oxygen species. So when you have an increase in oxidative stress like this, that's going to increase inflammation in the cell, which is going to lead to coagulation, as we talked about in our update 61, which talks about the increase in von Willebrand's factor that was found in a case of COVID-19 when they investigated that. And of course, those blood clots lead to hypoxemia. What can we do to prevent reactive oxygen species? Well, again, at night, if there is no light getting to the retina, no inhibition of the pineal gland, and it's going to secrete melatonin, which will then be uptaken into the mitochondria and bathe the mitochondria to prevent reactive oxygen species from damaging the mitochondria. In the daytime, near-infrared radiation, as we talked about, will excite cytochrome C oxidase and also increase melatonin production to put a damper on the reactive oxygen species. So the reactive oxygen species, again, is like heat in the engine, and the melatonin is the cooling system. And what may be going on is if people in general don't get enough sunlight and they're not getting enough sleep at night, then they're essentially running their engines hot. And when that car starts to go up the hill called COVID-19, if their engine is already running a little bit hot and then they get the added stress as we see here with a COVID-19 infection, that's going to put them over the edge and they're going to burn out their engine on the way up the hill. So what evidence do we have of this? Here's a paper that was published in December of 2021. And specifically, they looked for in COVID-19 patients signs of antioxidants in the cell signs of markers of oxidative stress, and signs of oxidative damage using these three things that they could measure both in the cell and also in the serum. So the first thing they looked at was measures of antioxidants. That's reduced glutathione, basically. As you can see in the control group, there were high amounts of this reduced glutathione in the young 21 to 40 year group. There was less, albeit higher than not, in the 41 to 60 year old group, and then a little bit lower again in the 60-plus-year-old group. But notice that for COVID, in all of these situations, there was a lower amount of reducing agents that were available to be able to reduce these oxidants in these patients. Okay, so we looked at intracellular reduced glutathione, a measure of antioxidants. Let's look at the measure of oxidative stress, which is the TBARS. You can see again in the control group, very low levels of oxidative stress in the COVID group, generally speaking, higher. And as the age went higher, the amount of oxidative stress also went higher. That's consistent with what we know about age and outcomes in COVID-19. All right, let's look at actual oxidative damage that's already occurred. For that, we're going to use the surrogate of F2 isoprostane. Once again, very similar situation for the control groups. Low oxidative damage for COVID, higher oxidative damage. And as the age went up, the amount of oxidative damage also went up. So the question remains is, what is doing the heavy lifting in terms of sunlight and COVID-19? Is it vitamin D or is it infrared radiation from the sun? Now, here's an interesting study that looked at just that question, although they used ultraviolet A radiation, which does not produce vitamin D, as a surrogate for the amount of sunlight that they were getting. And the question was asked again, does this improve COVID-19 outcomes? What they did in this study was something that was very interesting. They looked at high enough latitudes, specifically in the United States, in the winter of 2020, and they eliminated this entire portion of the south of the United States where it's possible in the wintertime to actually get enough vitamin D to make a difference. So they eliminated vitamin D, and they just looked at these areas of the United States in the north, specifically, where they couldn't get enough vitamin D. And what they found was 
using ultraviolet A radiation as a surrogate for the amount of sunshine that they were getting, they found that as the amount of sunshine went up, specifically ultraviolet A radiation, the number of deaths from COVID-19 per million went down. When they found that, they applied it to England a priori, and they decided to do a validation of that study to see if the same thing happened there. Of course, they didn't have to eliminate because England is so far north in the wintertime that it's impossible to get enough vitamin D. And so the question was, is were they getting enough of something else in the sun? And sure enough, what they noticed is that as the amount of ultraviolet A radiation went up, mortality went down again. They were also able to validate that in Italy in exactly the same fashion. Leading the authors of this study to conclude, this study is observational, and therefore any causal interpretation needs to be taken with caution. However, if the relationship identified proves to be causal, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention. Given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway, it suggests possible new COVID-19 therapies. Well, let me respectfully suggest to you that the possible new therapy is not new at all, for it's possible that the infrared radiation in the sun, which can come at any angle at any time of the day, even at northern latitudes, may be responsible for the heavy lifting that sunlight is doing in COVID-19, and that vitamin D may be a marker of that infrared radiation. As you can see here, going back to the 1800s, this form of treatment was widely used. This was before antibiotics. It was widely available. It was cheap, and it was apparently very effective. They were able to actually build the buildings with this type of therapy in mind. In fact, I've talked to a number of my colleagues, some of them older, that trained at institutions around the country that had solariums as part of their hospitals where patients could regularly get wide spectrum of light. And this idea of going out into the sunshine for health reasons and making sure that you're not getting too much light exposure at night was something that was actually looked at with great positivity. One notable woman health reformer at the time in the 1800s said this, The feeble ones should press out into the sunshine as earnestly and naturally as do the shaded plants and vines. The pale and sickly grain blade that has struggled up out of the cold of early spring puts out the natural and healthy deep green after enjoying for a few days the health and life-giving rays of the sun. Go out into the light and warmth of the glorious sun, you pale and sickly ones, and share with the vegetation its life-giving, health-dealing power. That was published in 1871. She also wrote to one of her secretaries, Make it a habit not to sit up after 9 o'clock. Every light should be extinguished. This turning of night into day is a wretched, health-destroying habit. Well, a lot of modern technology has happened since the 1870s. How much of it has been helpful? If we look here at near-infrared human exposure over the last century or so, you can see a concerning trend. If we look at the 1800s here, this is how much visible light someone in the 1800s would have received, and this is how much near-infrared. Again, near-infrared is the type of light specifically shown to improve melatonin production in the mitochondria. By the 1950s, the amount of visible light had dropped, as did the near-infrared spectrum as well. By 1990, we're 50% fluorescent, 50% incandescent, and we are only spending about 15% of the time outdoors as opposed to 50% of the time outdoors with campfires back in the 1800s, campfires being a source of infrared radiation as well. You can see that the amount of infrared light had dropped further. And then today, at present, in developed countries where we have technology, we go from building to building in cars, you can see that the amount of visible light has stayed about the same, but the near-infrared radiation has dropped precipitously down very, very low. And if we review some of the things that may be contributing to that, we can see here that whereas in the past, here with the blue, we had incandescent light bulbs, which had much of their spectrum in the near-infrared range, With the new LED lights, you can see that almost exclusively LED lights are in the visible spectrum, the purpose of which is to conserve energy, and we're not getting much of any near-infrared radiation inside buildings where we spend a lot of our time. Of course, here you can see in the visible spectrum from the sun that a lot of the sunlight is in the near-infrared spectrum. Now, in some of the buildings that we live, there's different types of glass. 
There is clear glass, the type of glass that you would have had 50 years ago, in this red envelope here, which is near-infrared, transmits a large amount of near-infrared light. As we go from high solar gain, low E, to moderate solar gain, low E, to low solar gain, low E glass, you can see that the amount of near-infrared radiation that gets transmitted is becoming lower and lower and lower, and this is because of energy efficiency. So if you are living in a hot place and you put windows in that prevent the house from heating up, you don't have to use as much energy to cool down the office space. Once again, in modern societies and in nature, what's happening? When you get up at sunrise, the amount of near-infrared radiation is always there and it increases linearly as the sun goes up in the sky. However, it's generally speaking between the hours of 10 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon that most of the ultraviolet light comes through because it's weaker, it's not able to penetrate the atmosphere as well, and the sun needs to be higher in the sky. And so prior to that bolus of very high energy radiation in the ultraviolet light spectrum, even though it's high energy, it's not able to penetrate very well. In the beginning of the day, as you're spending outside, you're building up your melatonin shares in your mitochondria, preparing for the bombardment of ultraviolet radiation, and then afterwards repairing the damage that might have happened during the day. And so you can see here that being in nature and outside is perfectly facilitated to give you the protection that you need during the time when the ultraviolet radiation is coming in. Of course, this ultraviolet radiation is important in making vitamin D as well. And so the amount of free radicals here is in this sense, but it's also giving a lot of protection because of the NIR photons, which again, give you melatonin. As opposed to modern societies where we spend no time outside, there is no near-infrared photons, so these photons that reach our skin when we're inside do cause some amount of oxidative stress and the free radicals that get produced at a low level, but there's really no infrared radiation to mitigate that problem. And I would say if you want more information on this topic, please see the long video on light as medicine. But to summarize very quickly, we know that there is a seasonal variation in COVID-19, which is related to sunlight and probably less likely related to humidity or temperature, that vitamin D is associated with both sunlight exposure and better outcomes in COVID-19. Could it be a marker for something else that's in the sun? We know that sunlight exposure is now known to produce melatonin right where it could be beneficial in COVID-19, which is in the mitochondria. And we know that the ACE2 is directly related to oxidative stress in those cells, which could cause problems with thrombosis, which we know is involved in the mortality of patients with COVID-19. And we know that near-infrared radiation in the daytime, along with no light at night, both ensure that mitochondria are bathed in the health-producing melatonin and that that reduces harmful reactive oxygen species. And so what should we do with this information? Well, a lot of these things are associated with each other, but they all seem to line up very well. What we need to do is a well-controlled, randomized, controlled trial that can show whether or not sunlight or being outside can improve outcomes in COVID-19. It's not expensive. It's widely available. You don't need to produce it. And it could have an impact on public health in COVID-19. I believe that we should all be spending more time outside, not necessarily directly in the sun. Because remember, you don't need to be directly in the sun. The near-infrared radiation can penetrate through clothes and do its great work in the mitochondria to give you that buildup of melatonin. So you don't need to be directly in the sun. You can still be covered up. You can still follow the advice of your dermatologist. You can still wear sunscreen. The near-infrared will penetrate through that. Consider even hospitalized patients, having them outside if possible, or at least next to windows that don't filter out near-infrared radiation to see if we can improve outcomes in COVID-19. I believe that this happens immediately within minutes of being in the sunlight, being within near-infrared radiation. You get an increase in antioxidants such as melatonin right where you need it, right there in the mitochondria. Oral melatonin, taking melatonin supplements is not going to help you during the day because it's going to tell your body that it's time to sleep. And if it's not time to sleep, it's not going to be beneficial. So oral melatonin is not a substitute for going outside. And I want to say here very specifically, there's been a lot of talk about vitamin D and how much vitamin D you should take. It would be a mistake to consider taking oral vitamin D a substitute for going outside into the sun 
based on what we are showing here in this video and based on the understanding of near-infrared radiation and what it does in the mitochondria. I think the contents of this video should be seen by everybody as I believe it has implications not only at the individual level, but also the public health level as well. Please join us at medcram.com for more educational videos for healthcare providers and for those that want to know more about medicine. Thanks for joining us.